Now, Washington Mornings on the Mall. At AM 630. Good morning, everybody. It is 706, uh, 707 on WMAL, where Washington comes to talk. Uh, we are uh, officially announcing the new member of our team this morning. Uh, he's been here for a couple of weeks uh, filling in, but now it's official. Yes. Uh, Larry O'Connor is our new co host here on WMAL, and I couldn't be more happy to have you here. Welcome aboard, officially, Larry. Thank you, Brian. You've been so amazingly generous and gracious and supportive these last two weeks. I trust that that will all end Well, that's, that's because I still get first billing. Yeah, yeah exactly. That, no, it's I'm just saying. an alphabetical thing, folks. It's, it's, Brian it's, comes before Larry. We are pleased to be joined on the line by a former Speaker of the House, former 2012 presidential candidate, uh, Newt Gingrich. We'll also be uh, joined in a few minutes by Callista Gingrich, but we want to start it first by talking uh, with uh, the former speaker about what's going on in Washington right now. Elections are over. The the die has been cast as far as who's going to be our next president. But we still have a Republican House of Representatives and there's going to have to be some negotiations about how we avoid this trip over the fiscal cliff, Mr. Speaker. So you've been a guy who's laid down markers before. As you see all that's going on in Washington today, what's your assessment of what you see? Well, I think it's very important that we focus on trying to get some things done. And uh, the technique that President Clinton and I used was to sit down face-to-face. So we spent over 35 days negotiating uh, in small rooms in the White House. And uh, he would, I would outline what we had to have and what we couldn't do. He'd outline what he had to have and what he couldn't do. <clears throat> We'd then try to find some place in the middle that represented something we could both survive with. But and, do you uh, do you see in Barack Obama the same willingness to negotiate that uh, yeah. that you saw in Bill Clinton? Yeah, President Clinton was not trying to fundamentally but, transform our country. Well, I, I chatted with a member of the administration yesterday who had asked me you know, about this, and I said, this is the biggest decision he's made since he decided in February of 2009 to go to the hard left and pass the stimulus with no one having read it. Uh, he had a chance in his last administration to be a centrist president governing with a great deal of support from Republicans, and he threw it away to go with a hard left series of policies, including Obamacare. Now, the election's over. Barack Obama is the president of the United States. Ideally, all of us should want to work with him because ideally, we want the president of the United States to be successful. I think that's a very key part of us. All of us who are conservatives, let's take a deep breath. That's hard to say, but for the sake of America, is there a common ground that doesn't violate our principles or his principles? Um, We don't know today that he has to be as aggressive in the second term, and it may be since Speaker Boehner has pretty intelligently laid out a marker that President Obama will realize he can't be as aggressive this term. Well, it'll guarantee a disaster, and it will turn 2014 into just a devastating defeat for Democrats. Well, the president is going to hold an, a, a, an event this morning in which he lays down his position on this. So I would imagine that if the president comes out and he has sort of a softer tone, that's a sign that compromise is possible. But I, but if he comes out hammering the table, well, look, saying we must have, we table, must have, we he, must have. If he comes out hammering the table, nothing will get done. That's right. The country will be in a mess. It'll be obvious to most Americans he's being unreasonable. We don't elect dictators. We elect the leader of the executive branch, who under the Constitution is defined after the legislative branch. The House is Article One, Section 1. The Founding Fathers fully expected the legislative branch to legislate. Uh, and I think that, you know, if, if the choice gets to be between congressional Republicans seeking a common ground and Democrats moving to the left, and certainly if you look at the election in the Senate, you've got in um, Wisconsin and in Massachusetts, uh, new Democrats who are going to be very far to the left. Uh, so it, it depends on what happens. Uh, I think we should put the country first. And we should uh, we should say we want to find some way to solve these problems for the good of America and the good of our children and grandchildren. Now we're not going to sell out our principles, uh, but there are lots of. Let me give you an example of more revenue. If the president would agree to the development of oil and gas assets, and this is something we developed with Scott Noble, uh, the largest royalty manager in the United States, we think they could find 
$780 billion in revenue over the next 20 years. Wow. Just out of royalties. That's more money for the government with no tax increase. Now, do you have to have a tax increase, or can you just accept more revenue? Right. They want to cut spending. I've advocated for years, helped write a book called Stop Paying the Crooks. Just apply the American Express Visa or MasterCard model of fraud detection to Medicare and Medicaid. You save between 70 and $110 billion by just being smarter than crooks. Mr. Now, you know, so there are ways to solve this that don't involve being stupid. Mr. Speaker, I hate to jump in here, but uh, this is awkward, but we have a bigger name on the other line. Callista Gingrich joins us now, <laughs> author of for Land my, of... For my health and safety, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I'm not supposed to bring her in here. Callista, author of Land of the Pilgrim's Pride. We talked about this last week. You have this really, really fun series of children's books, uh, reinstating uh, patriotism and an understanding of the uh, foundation of our nation. Thank you so much for writing these books, and, and, and you're, you've got an event this weekend for it? Well, good morning. Yes, thanks for having me. We are going to have a book signing at Barnes & Noble in Bethesda at 1 o'clock, and we hope that if you're in the area, you'll stop by. So that's 1 o'clock on Saturday. 1 o'clock on Saturday in Bethesda, okay. and, and apparently you're bringing your husband along, uh, and you've got a book of your own, someone tells me? That's right. <laughs> uh, my new book is called Land of the Pilgrim's Pride, and this is the second in my series featuring Ellis the Elephant. And in Land of the Pilgrim's Pride, Ellis discovers how our nation began as he learns about colonial America. And, you know, if we want to keep America great, our children really have to understand where we've come from. And this portion of our history, colonial America, is a major and often unknown part of our history. And I really think it's vitally important that our kids understand how we began as a nation and how our characteristics and traits were formed during the colonial period. Callista, your, your, your husband loves to brag on uh, the fact that you sing uh, every Sunday in the church choir over at the, uh, at the, uh, at the cathedral, but, but uh, I'm hearing your voice this morning. Are you an alto? I am an alto. Okay, Actually, good. I'm an alto, too. I got gotcha. you. All right, all right. I just wanted to be clear on that. because So, so you, you sing the tough part. Yeah, we sing a lot of Renaissance music at the Basilica, and I, I really enjoy being an alto there. Oh, uh, that's fantastic. And, and uh, uh, Mr. Speaker, your book, Victory at Yorktown, uh, uh, that, that is out now, you're going to be bringing that along to we the are, Barnes and & Noble. Well. and I are launching an American Legacy book tour. We think particularly in the context of this election that a lot of Americans want to be engaged in reminding their children and their grandchildren, and frankly, in a lot of cases, learning themselves about what has made America a great country. And so we have, uh, I think, over 20... Uh, Book signings lined up over the next uh, six weeks or so. That's great. And I want to report for the record, I do not sing. <laughs> I go to the I'm in the audience, uh, and I'm, I'm uh, happy to listen to my wife sing because right. she actually has a good voice. And no one has ever accused me of that. Let me uh, just bring full circle our political discussion, Mr. Speaker. One more sort of political assessment. A lot of people, a lot of Republicans now, feeling like, oh my gosh, a, a little hungover by the whole process. A lot of navel gazing going on. In about a, about 30, 40 seconds, can you tell me what went wrong? Well, I think, first of all, we have to confront the, the absolute reality that until we become an inclusive party that includes Asian Americans, includes uh, Latino Americans, includes African Americans, includes Native Americans, we're going to be permanently uh, in danger of being a minority party, ironically, because of our inability to be inclusive for minorities. And I think this is a very serious problem at every level of the party. But remember, we, we're going to go into this next year with 30 Republican governors. We're going to go into this with a majority in the U.S. House of Representatives. Uh, we, we have 45 U.S. Senators. We have an absolute majority of state legislators in this country. The Republican Party can solve problems, can develop a better future, and can find innovative answers far superior to a left-wing state government-dominated system. So I'm, I'm optimistic about okay. the future, but it does require having the courage to learn some lessons from the election results this year. Former Speaker of the House, Newt Gingrich, Callista Gingrich, thank you so much for joining us. Great, great to do it. Greatly appreciate it. Good luck on your book signing.